Okay. Uh, okay, first of all, thank you for the wonderful introduction. And we are so delighted to have Becky and Brahano as rheumatologists in uh, Ethiopia. Uh, this is a very basic introduction because a lot of you, because there was no rheumatologist previously in Ethiopia, have not had uh, training. So um, anyway, so I'm going to introduce you on how to approach someone with joint pain. And uh, hopefully, as time goes on, you'll have other speakers who will discuss some of the finer uh, points. So let me... So these are uh, two pictures of people that I saw in uh, Ethiopia, Black Lion, in the rheumatology clinic. Uh, the first one is a woman with rheumatoid arthritis, and the second is a man with tophaceous scalp. And the reason that I'm taking time on this magnificent, magnificent Saturday morning, I know it's Saturday afternoon where you are, is because um, these two people can be afforded an opportunity to have a normal, uh, in quotes, uh, functional life if they had the proper medication. And um, this is an opportunity to learn how to diagnose these patients. Some, some of these people you can treat on your own, and then some of them you can now refer to uh, Becky and Brahano. So the goals today is to, to be aware of the impact of joint pain, um, how to develop a logical plan that will help you uh, with diagnostic clues to create a differential diagnosis, and to understand the difference between inflammatory and non-inflammatory joint pain. Now, I think a lot of times um, someone comes in with joint pain and we, you know, it's not as exciting as having a heart failure or something wrong with their lungs. But this is a look at the years lost to disability uh, worldwide. And musculoskeletal disorders are the second leading cause of um, time lost to disability. And in places like Ethiopia, it's even worse because you don't have paved sidewalks. Uh, someone who, who might be able to use a cane in a wheelchair may not have the opportunity uh, there just because of the, the way um, uh, the country is, is set up. So the first thing that you do to start with is um, history. Um, as William Osler said, listen to your patient. He is telling you the diagnosis. So the first thing when someone comes in complaining of joint pain is to decide, is it the joint uh, or is it not the joint? And I'm going to go into how you work this up. Is it inflammatory or, or non-inflammatory? Is it acute or chronic? Is it monoarticular, polyarticular, symmetric or non-symmetric? Systemic symptoms, weight loss, fatigue, and extraarticular signs. So if someone comes in with um, a sore you know, pain in their knee, you might not ask them about systemic symptoms, but this is extremely important to do. Now, uh, the first thing, I'm talking about joint pain, but you want to decide is the pain from a bursa, a tendon, a ligament, uh, or muscle, and is the pain referred from another joint? So I show over here, um, Let's see, I don't think I have my, I think I got my pointer on. Uh, I don't know if you can see this, but you can see over here, there's a trochanteric bursa over the hip. A lot of times people come in complaining of hip pain, but it's really not their hip, um, it's the bursa. And then just to remind you about referred pain, the referred pain that we see the most is really in the neck. So a lot of times people will come in complaining of shoulder pain. You examine their shoulder, it's completely normal, and the pain is actually coming from their neck. And they may have some numbness or tingling, which will give you a clue. And also it's a pain radiation. So this is uh, just to remind you of your anatomy. Um, the joints are very complicated. So you can have tenderness at the emphysis, which is where the ligament attaches to bone. And this we see in the seronegative spondyloarthropathies, um, the joint capsule, the synovial membrane, and rheumatoid arthritis. 
uh, articular cartilage, of course, in the meniscus. You can get synovial fluid. You can have pain from the nerves, um, the bursa, and the uh, tendons. So there's three broad categories of causes of joint pain, inflammatory, non-inflammatory, and arthralgias. Inflammatory uh, inflammation affecting a joint um, such as the synovial cavity and the emphysis. So there's pain which is present at rest and with motion. The patients will have morning stiffness and this will last often uh, over uh, 60 minutes. Uh, they'll have joint swelling uh, with synovial, whoops, let me get this uh, back. Uh, they'll have joint swelling with synovial hypertrophy, um, an effusion or inflammation, and they'll often have uh, increased markers of inflammation. Now, this picture over here is a patient of mine um, who had rheumatoid arthritis, and she just did not want to take um, methotrexate. And she had a just a magnificent response to methotrexate. To methotrexate, I initially had to, I think, give her uh, more um, a different medication, but this will just uh, tell you uh, what happens when it's untreated. And this is in my own practice. We have people who don't want to take meds. Um, so that's inflammatory arthritis. Then the next broad category is non-inflammatory arthritis, and this is uh, mainly in alterations of the. Um, the mechanics um, of the joint or the structure. So this can occur uh, after someone has had trauma, maybe osteoarthritis and mechanical damage. So the pain occurs mainly during motion and improves uh, quickly with rest. So it's the opposite of um, inflammatory. They will have morning or can have morning stiffness, but it's usually less than 30 minutes uh, in the morning. They can have joint involvement from osteophytes, which would be bony enlargement, or they can have uh, synovial cysts or an effusion. This is a patient um, with osteoarthritis, and you can appreciate the fullness in the suprapatella bursa, um, and their inflammatory markers will be normal. And arthralgia is pain localized to a joint, but apart from joint tenderness, there's no abnormalities of the joint can be identified. You can see this in fibromyalgia, early rheumatoid arthritis, viral infections, and drug reactions. This is important because if you don't find anything on physical examination uh, other than the tenderness, it doesn't mean that there's nothing wrong uh, with the patients. So epidemiology is uh, important. So you have someone who comes in with joint pain, and these are some of the factors that will help you to um, narrow your differential diagnosis. First is age. There's certain things like post-streptococcal arthritis. This is something that we see mainly in children. If you have an older adult, that's not going to be in the diagnosis. Sex. Lupus is more common in women, although we do see it in men, and the same is with gout. Gout is more common in men, but we don't, uh, but you can see it in women. You just see it a little bit older in, in older women and also women who have comorbidities. Uh, geographic location. So tuberculosis and pot dis disease is common in Africa. Uh, I've seen one case of tuberculosis and, uh, of a joint and one case of POTS disease in over 30 years of practice. Um, I don't think you have Lyme arthritis in Africa. So you need to know um, where the patient is from. And by the same token, you want to get a travel history. Comorbidities are extremely important. Uh, I mentioned that we don't see gout usually in uh, younger women or premenopausal women, but a woman who's got chronic uh, kidney disease is an increased risk for, uh, for gout. Uh, medications, uh, so we know that steroids increase the risk of osteoporosis, diuretics, gout. Family history is extremely important. Um, the same as you have some patients who just have a clustering uh, with cancer, we have the same thing with autoimmune disease. And don't forget that thyroid disease is often uh, autoimmune. 
Social history is also important. Um, alcohol use, especially beer, is associated with gout. Occupation uh, can make someone more predisposed to osteoarthritis, and of course, sexual history. And this is a, a malar rash in someone with lupus. So the pain experience is also important. Gout and infection are very, very painful. Uh, bone pain um, from metastatic disease is just in a whole other category. Their pain is present uh, day and night and is severe um, and really should not be confused with one of our diseases. Uh, inflammatory pain uh, occurs at rest and I had mentioned is associated with morning sp stiffness, especially in the mornings, and this can be quite severe. And osteoarthritis, the pain is, uh, like I said, is related to joint use. Uh, it can be pretty bad sometimes. Sometimes it's just more annoying. And nerve or neuralgic uh, pain is deep and may have uh, paresthesias. So uh, we looked at um, the severity of the pain, um, the epidemiology, and the other is um, the diagnostic pattern. So uh, there's certain uh, monoarthritis, of course, is just one joint. Oligoarthritis is up to four joints, and polyarthritis is five or more joints. And that helps us, and I'll go on and give you a slide uh, more on that. Uh, the distribution of the joint involvement. Um, rheumatoid arthritis is su surprisingly symmetrical. It is usually more severe on the dominant side. Uh, the arthritis of lupus is also uh, symmetrical. Uh, psoriatic arthritis is usually asymmetrical, as is gout, and the peripheral arthritis of the spondyloarthropathies. The involvement of the skeleton of the back is um, in the spondyloarthropathies and in osteoarthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis does not involve the thoracic or lumbar spine. This is important because uh, when we do these uh, pain measurements, these global um, scores in people with rheumatoid arthritis, you really want to separate um, back pain because back pain is so common, but uh, people with rheumatoid arthritis does not affect the lumbar or thoracic spine. So the, uh, I mentioned that the number of joints is important. So monoarticular pain, we usually um, we think of infection. Again, you can't have polyarticular with infection, but it's usually uh, monoarticular, and that could be bacterial, fungal, or mycobacteria. Uh, inflammatory pain can be uh, polyarticular, so we do have patients who have crystal-induced arthritis that have several joints involved, although we tend to think of it as being uh, only one joint. Juvenile idiopathic arthritis, this is in children, uh, can be one joint or can be several joints. And the peripheral arthritis um, with spondyloarthropathy can also just be in uh, one joint. Um, bone or cartilage disorders such as osteonecrosis can be just one joint. And of course, trauma um, with a fracture would be monoarticular unless you're in a major accident. So, um, so it's not only the number of joints and the distribution of the joints, it's also the onset of the pain. So in people who have um, acute onset of the joint pain over hours to days, that would make us think of infectious arthritis or crystal arthritis. Uh, chronic, which would be over six weeks, would be non-inflammatory, such as osteoarthritis. Uh, people with rheumatoid arthritis sometimes can't even pinpoint exactly when the pain started, so it's kind of gradual. People with lupus, reactive arthritis, and spondyloarthropathy, uh, the pain can be gradual. So notice I mentioned crystal, you see it twice. You see it as acute and you see it as chronic. Um, and then we have um, chronic, of course, over time would be osteoarthritis. 
Uh, Crystal-induced arthritis would be intermittent. You don't have Lyme arthritis as far as we know. Uh, migratory arthritis, uh, you know better than I do because we see very little rheumatic fever, gonococcal uh, arthritis, viral arthritis, and chikungunya. So this is, again, just to review, you want to know the mode of onset of the joint pain, whether it's acute or insidious, the duration, if it's self-limiting or chronic, the number of joints involved, monoarticular, oligoarthritis, or polyarthritis, the distribution, symmetric or asymmetric, localization of affected joints, the sequence, whether it's additive, migratory, or intermittent, and the local pattern um, of involvement in individual joints. This will all help you develop a differential diagnosis. Now, one of the other important parts of the history is to see if there are other extra-articular manifestations. And again, what can happen sometimes is someone comes in with joint pain and you neglect to ask um, about extra-articular uh, manifestations. Uh, where I'm located, we're right across the, uh, the street from an eye hospital. So I think that my uh, view of the world uh, has been biased as a result, but we see uh, they send us a lot of patients with uveitis, and um, the uveitis may be so bad, and the back pain may be a little vague, uh, so that the patients um, have not been diagnosed with a spondyl or arthropathy. We see quite a bit of sarcoid. I don't know if you have much sarcoid in Ethiopia. And of course, there's a uveitis and scleritis associated with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, the urogenital symptoms that can be associated with reactive arthritis and um, inflammatory bowel disease or infectious arthritis can have an um, can be seen in um, people with diarrhea, whether it's infectious or uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, can have arthritis. And what I years ago, I actually saw someone with really severe, uh, or a few patients who came in with arthritis, who uh, their joint pain was so bad that they really neglected um, that they had uh, diarrhea and really what their problem was inflammatory bowel disease and treatment of the inflammatory bowel disease took care of their arthritis. Uh, the arthritis of inflammatory bowel ca disease can be quite inflammatory and painful. So don't forget when someone comes in with, especially a young person uh, with um, a swollen hot knee to ask if they're having diarrhea. So um, the distribution of the joints um, also helps in uh, the diagnosis. The distal interphalangeal joint is involved in psoriatic arthritis, gout, or osteoarthritis, but is usually spared in rheumatoid arthritis. And as I mentioned before, the lumbar spine is involved in ankylosing spondylitis, but spared in rheumatoid arthritis. There's distinct uh, types of musculoskeletal involvement. You can see on the slide over here, I showed that there's inflammation at the site of the uh, insertion of the Achilles tendon. Um, this is common in the spondyloarthropathies. Um, you can have dactylitis in uh, people with psoriatic arthritis. Uh, apparently, very children can get dactylitis with sickle cell but these are adults who are going to have the dactylitis. Um, okay, the other, other um, extra-articular manifestations are constitutional symptoms. People who have, uh, let's say, arthritis from lupus or rheumatoid arthritis are going to feel tired. And uh, But people who have osteoarthritis are going to feel fine other than their joint pain. I can't emphasize enough, that, I, and I know you're so, so busy, but do a skin examination because um, people sometimes, especially, well, with anything, um, we see people who have um, psoriasis, um, the 
picture on the right over here is someone with Gautrin's complex where they had these little scaly uh, lesions over the um, PIPs and the MCPs and also the DIPs. And this is just classic for dermatomyositis. Uh, ocular symptoms I mentioned in rheumatoid arthritis, but also in granulomatous poly um, arteritis. Um, and then we see anterior uveitis and spondyloarthropathies. And on the next slide, I'll show more. Um, this is um, at the bottom over here is a patient who has um, a painless oral ulcer in lupus. Remember, painless. So if you're suspecting lupus, just go on and um, you know check in their mouth. There's a second. Okay, this is um, a picture just to remind you of the anterior chamber and uh, with um, uveitis, but just how common. Um, so the other side of the coin is, is if you have someone who has uh, uveitis, you really want to check them for um, rheumatic uh, disease such as ankylosing spondylitis, Bechet's, Crohn's, juvenile idiopathic, um, the various vasculitis. We see um, uh, granulomatous um, polyangiitis, giant cell arteritis, and it's rare in lupus. So fever. Um, fever is another uh, finding that helps us uh, when someone has joint pain. Obviously, if someone has uh, septic arthritis, you would expect for them to have a fever disseminated gonococcal arthritis. But here is another one to really think about. If someone has endocarditis, they can present with fever and arthritis. So depending on the setting, you may want to get blood cultures uh, to make sure that a patient does not have uh, endocarditis. Uh, you see much more mycobacterial disease than I do and fungal infections. Um, Post-infectious uh, arthritis, this will be someone who may have had um, a, a infection with um, a GI infection, uh, can present with um, a fever, acute rheumatic fever, and of course post-streptococcal arthritis. But these are the things to remember. Um, someone with um, lupus, inflammatory bowel disease, vasculitis and crystal induced arthritis and paraneoplastic can come into the hospital looking fairly toxic. And it's important to remember um, these diseases in your workup. Um, remember drug induced lupus, I don't know if you're using much hydralazine, but hydralazine is definitely, uh, if someone's on hydralazine, has joint pain and a fever, um, be concerned about that. Uh, inflammatory bowel disease that patients can get, I mean, I've seen them with a really painful swollen joints. And again, like I said previously, they just, they may be having so much pain from the joint disease that they don't really mention their bowel disease. Uh, vasculitis, so patients can be very toxic looking, have joint pain uh, and fever. Um, and gout, um, sometimes patients get admitted to the hospital to rule out sepsis, and really all, all they have is a crystal-induced arthritis. So here's, um, let's see if I can, I was trying, okay, I tried to make, the, I had a video down here, but so the physical examination helps you. Uh, the synovial membrane is normally is not palpable um, in chronic synovial uh, in chronic inflammatory arthritis. The synovial membrane has a doughy or bo boggy consistency. Um, the, 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 it may be a little warm, but not that warm. Uh, we don't really see much erythema, and a joint infusion can be seen in inflammatory or non-inflammatory arthritis. Yeah, I, oh, here it is. You can see, you see the bulge sign? Let me see if I can get it to repeat again. Okay, but anyway, you can see the bogginess uh, over here. This is a suit, uh, an effusion, and then I showed you a bulge sign, but anyway, I can't get it to repeat. 
Um, this is a patient who has rheumatoid arthritis, and you can see that there's a fullness over here over the uh, MCP joints. Um, the right wrist, you can kind of see the ulnar styloid, but that looks like it has some synovial thickening over it. Over the left wrist, you really can't um, see the ulnar styloid. Um, he's got a little bit of synovial thickening here. There's, this is, he may have injured the fifth uh, DIP over here, but this is a man who's got, uh, I won't say early, but kind of early in um, somewhat advanced uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Now I, here you go. So this is, I'm going to just show you. Okay, so I want to take a picture of my holding his I'm going to take, then... okay, so this is what's called a squeeze test, what I was doing there. And you can see that he can't make a grip. And on this hand, he also, there's some, unless you have them actually close their hands, you may not appreciate that they can't make, um, make a grip. And again, I do the squeeze test. This is looking over the wrist. And then I'm going to show you, uh, yeah, you want to go flexion and extension. And this is important. You can see the wrist over there. I mean, the elbow, there's some synovial thickening over the elbow. And he's got synovial thickening over here as well. So that's um, typical of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, let me just get this to... Okay, we got stuck here. Okay, so um, moving on on the physical examination. Uh, this is uh, someone who has osteoarthritis. Uh, and you can see the, these are the Heberden's nodes over the DIP joint and Bouchard's nodes over the PIP joint. They're going to have bony enlargement, and the patient may lose their ability to make a good uh, grip. So again, when you uh, examine someone, you're trying to decide, is it monoarticular, is it symmetric, asymmetric, does it involve one extremity, is it uh, axial, are there any anecdotes? atomic abnormalities, joint instability, decreased range of motion. Um, is there true muscle weakness as opposed to fatigue or joint uh, abnormalities? And um, is there joint tenderness? Now this one over here, uh, well, I'm getting ready I, okay, uh, to, to check to see if she has uh, tenderness. We do, I, I can't get this one to go. Okay, well. Um, the difficulty you have using your hands. Oh, I can't. I can't lift. Can you make a grip? Um, not real tight. Okay. And in the morning, how do your hands feel? They real stiff for a few hours. And I usually take Tylenol since I have no other medicine. Take like a thousand milligram of them and sit still until they. You okay. Know, and, then, and you want to see? Yeah, this is a swan neck deformity, and there's ulnar deviation over here. And there's thickening of the MCPs, and then when I give a grip, ah, yeah. that uh, and that hurts, and that's just that that's right, and that's showing that there's active inflammation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so that patient that I uh, just showed you, uh, I did the squeeze test, and she that hurt, and that's typical of um, rheumatoid arthritis. You heard that she had uh, morning stiffness, and we actually don't see too many patients with uh, that severe of deformity. Um, right now in my clinic uh, at Jefferson, if someone comes up in with a swan neck deformity, I'm likely to have a few residents, uh, a few fellows come in and want to take pictures. So that's what we hope for Ethiopia, is that these physical findings um, that we see in rheumatoid arthritis will become of historical um, significance because our, our new medications are really giving uh, our patients almost uh, a normal life. And this is why I'm so happy to have Becky and Brahano in Ethiopia and while I'm spending a Saturday morning with you because uh, we really can we really can make a difference. Now the, the next slide is um, the importance of um, of uh, objective findings. So this is a patient who's very sad. Uh, he has severe 
heart failure, and his um, diuretics were being constantly uh, manipulated, and he kept having uh, one severe, severe attack of gout after another. And you can see, uh, you can just imagine how painful this was for him. So joint tenderness alone is subjective and is not diagnostic of arthritis. Joint redness can suggest inflammation, uh, infection or crystalline arthritis. Um, and you also can have, um, I actually had one patient in my many years of practice who had everything. She had urate crystals, she had calcium pyrophosphate, and her, um, her culture was positive in one knee. Uh, so just because you have one doesn't rule out the other. Uh, joint wor warmth um, uh, can be present, um, but uh, our patients with rheumatoid arthritis often don't have any increase uh, in temperature or just mild increase. And um, you need to be able to distinguish a joint effusion from thickened synovium, uh, and it's not always uh, that easy. So um, you need to look for, um, is the contralateral joint um, involved? And this will help you. Um, you can have, um, and to look at the skin and the nails. So the slide that I show you right here is, um, is it was a security worker uh, and came in with swelling and pain of her ankle. She was referred over from the emergency room, and they just didn't notice that she had psoriasis. I mean, she's got the skin rash over here, her toenails are abnormal, and uh, I treated her psoriasis, and she, uh, she improved. So um, I mentioned looking for rashes in lupus, and in lupus, you, again, want to... Um, check their hard palate because they might have a uh, non-painful ulcer. Uh, you want to look for telangiectation. Patients uh, could have scleroderma. And the pits of the ris ridges in the nails are in psoriasis. The eyes are extremely important. Um, I've already mentioned uveitis, dryness, of course, you can see in Sjogren's. Uh, the genitalia uh, are important um, for um, uh, to, for uh, reactive arthritis, and uh, even dental decay is important. Uh, people who have Sjogren's may have uh, problems with their teeth, and also people who have dental decay can become uh, septic. Okay. Um, this is just a, um, to, to show you how we think of the joints, uh, you don't, uh, I'm sure you don't have one of these, uh, but it's just, uh, when you think about it, you, this helps you to look to see if there's uh, symmetry, joints involved, and is one way of monitoring uh, the patients. So I'm gonna give you a um, little scenario. Uh, this is going to be three 55-year-old women. Uh, they come in with hand pain. There's um, one of them has aching in her hands of gradual onset for a few months. The second one has severe pain uh, for one day. And the third is not sure how long she's had pain. And it's more severe in the right hand. So I want you to start... <laughs> Uh, thinking about what these women can have. And as I go through what we've been discuss discussing, the epidemiology, the diagnostic pattern, physical and diagnostic testing, I, the diagnosis should become more obvious. So right off the bat, they're all women, they're all 55. So, um, okay, let's, so one has a history of Hashimoto's and her mother had rheumatoid arthritis. One has chronic renal disease and is on a diuretic, and the other one has no major medical uh, problems, and her mother's hands were deformed, but did not uh, complain of pain. So we're using the honor system to see who comes up with the correct diagnoses. Um, the next person has morning stiffness for over one hour, 
and has similar pain in the wrists, shoulders, knees, and ankles. Um, the second one, the pain is excruciating and has had episodes of similar pain in the knees and wrists, uh, usually lasts a few days. And the third one has aching at times in the knees that is more severe with weight bearing, uh, but does not impede the ability to walk. Um, I don't know, does anyone want to volunteer or use the chats to, to start giving us a diagnosis? Okay, I'm not getting uh, uh, any answers. Okay, um, so the next thing is on physical. You have some synovial thickening over the MCPs, cannot make a complete grip, moderate effusion in the knees. Uh, the second one, had the right hand is exquisitely tender over the DIP of the index finger, red and swollen, and the remainder of the joint exam is normal. And the third, there's bony enlargement of the DIP joint, small effusion in the knees, um, and the patient was surprised to find out that she had the effusion in her knees. Uh, the first patient, she had an elevated SED rate and C-reactive protein, rheumatoid factor, and anti-CCP. Uh, so she has rheumatoid arthritis, but you see how just getting the story, uh, we knew what diagnostic test uh, to order. Uh, the second one, um, 55, is certainly old enough for a woman to have gout, but a little bit young, but she's got chronic renal disease. And the third one uh, has osteoarthritis. So just um, uh, to see how we work through these. Also notice that I uh, did not put in ANA. Uh, you may, uh, th there was really nothing to su suggest lupus in these uh, patients. So thank you. Remember to listen closely to the patient's story. Do a very complete physical examination only order diagnostic testing, which I did not discuss. If you feel there is a good probability, they will help with uh, the diagnosis. And after many years, this is still not easy. Uh, the caveat on diagnostic testing is a difficult one. Um, there's a knee-jerk response to order an ANA on patients who have, especially young women who have joint pain, I'm not going to say you should never order an ANA because that would be ridiculous, but make sure that there's still a good probability that the patient do, could have lupus because uh, normal people sometimes can have a positive ANA and it creates a lot of psychological stress. By the same token, even a rheumatoid factor, um, if it comes out positive, and you and which it can, especially in people who have chronic uh, diseases, um, can create some uh, anxiety. And with that, uh, I these are some of the references that I use. But I would encourage you. The um, of course I'm an American, but the American College of Rheumatology um, at rheumatology.org has an excellent website. It not only does it have some educational programs on it, uh, it has guidelines for diagnosis and treatment. Now, I understand that uh, in Ethiopia, you do not have all the diagnostic testing nor um, the medications that would be present in the guidelines, but this will uh, at least give you some guidance. And I'm hoping now that we have Burhano and Becky in Ethiopia, that um, some of the diagnostic testing and, uh, and pharmacologic, um, well, some of the drugs that we need uh, will become available. So I'm going to open this up for questions. Thank you. Okay, I guess there's a chat here. Okay, so here's... Uh, Mute my mic. I have to mute my mic. Just a second. No, I can't. Use that. Yes, yes, you got these. Okay.
Okay, I don't. Fit some? Um, you, you want me okay. to type something in the chat box? Let's see. There is. Uh, my connection is very poor. I would like if you upload this video oh. on oh, YouTube. Oh, there's me. Becky. Hi, Becky. Can can you introduce Becky? Yes, uh, I actually was waiting to the end of the lecture so that we can have some Q and A's and also introduce Becky and Brahanu and also Rimatology for all we can have discussion. Yeah. yeah. So if all panelists, if you can, is it, is it possible for you to turn on your videos? Yeah, like my tech, yeah. Oh, oh, I see. I didn't put my video on. Here I am. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I, I went through so much trouble to, to set my video up and then I didn't even put it there. Okay. All right. So I see Becky here. Um, again, um, let me, um, for the other panel the attendees who will join later, thank you, Dr. Michelle, for this excellent lecture into introduction to rheumatology. I know there's, you know, a, a huge gap in, you know, understanding and managing and diagnosing rheumatology cases in Ethiopia. And this is a very first step. Hopefully we can have more lectures on this topic. And I'm thankful for Dr. Metzer, not only for this lecture, but also for the wonderful work that she's doing in Ethiopia for her love of Ethiopia and for starting this rheumatology program in Ethiopia. And we have the honor to have Dr. Becky and Brahan also on the panelists today. These are the first two rheumatologists trained by uh, Dr. Michelle's organization, Rheumatology for All. And uh, maybe Becky, can you say something? Nice to meet you. Uh, my name is uh, Becky. Uh, am I audible? Be I can hear. It's very, uh, but, but not too much. Can you speak a little louder? I think uh, my connection is unstable. Uh, okay. But thank you for this invite and uh, thank you, Dr. Michelle, for the nice presentation. Uh, I'm happy to be involved in this uh, continuous uh, presentations. And thank you. Uh, for the opportunity as well. So, if you have any questions about the arthritis in the practice in Ethiopia, I'm happy to provide answers to you as well. Yeah, I think that um, Becky and Burhano are much more aware of the local realities. Is uh, so that's why I, I really defer to them. But if anyone has any questions about how we approach patients or anything that I can possibly answer. Oh, also, I made a video. It's seven minutes on how to do a physical, a rheumatologic physical examination that I, um, I think fits and can- I can share them on the chat. Yeah, you can also. share it. You can fast forward it uh, through parts of it. I just thought it would be tedious to, to watch it now. Okay, oh, I think we have a question. Here. Yeah, I, I can't answer live. There's a question, but I can't. It just says my connection is poor. But I don't know if there are any other questions. Anyone who has questions can raise hands on the, and I will let you come up and speak questions. But in the meantime, um, can you tell us more about rheumatology, how the rheumatology program started in Ethiopia and the work you're doing with rheumatology for all? And someone is uh, asking us about, because they don't have a lot of awareness about rheumatology. One question I see is, can you please tell us about the specialty? So, um... Well, I'll tell you a little bit about how the whole business started. Is um, uh, Dr. Yuman Duosen, who's a nephrologist at Black Lion, uh, was very concerned that his uh, patients with lupus nephritis were doing so poorly. And it was do uh, Dr. Yuman Duosen who I'm not sure how contacted, she's no, uh, no longer in our group, but uh, Inez uh, Colmegana. And we came to Black Lion in, um, I think it was 2015 or 2016 and did a CME. Now the things in, the, the situation in Ethiopia, unfortunately is not atypical. There's a worldwide shortage of 
rheumatologists. And it's particularly severe in um, resource limited uh, areas. And the tragedy is, is that, um, I mean, you have some, med you don't have all the, the medicines that we have, but the picture that I show at the top of someone um, with tophaceous scalp, uh, that just, you, you've got allopurinol. You just need to have some, you know, you need to be able to recognize it. You need to educate the patients. Um, and that's another problem. We have it here. I mean, you have people who won't take the, you know, we have the COVID vaccine and people won't take the COVID vaccine. We have people who've got gout and they won't take allopurinol. They have rheumatoid arthritis and they won't take methotrexate. So uh, it's our ob obligation to educate the public as best we can, but it really starts, which is why I'm doing this, is educating um, the local physician population, but we have to do, we had a program uh, we were trying to do for the pharmacists in Ethiopia, we need it for the nurses, we need it for everybody. I don't know, does that help? Let's see this. Tell us about the specialty. Okay, so um, rheumatology, we see, um, musculoskeletal disease, but a lot of autoimmune. And since I've been in practice, we're recognizing newer diseases and our therapies have become incredibly uh, effective. There are people that I've seen uh, now who would have become uh, disabled, who are leading normal lives and patients are living. Um, some of the drugs that are so important are available in Ethiopia. Uh, rituximab is a, is a monoclonal antibody that is very effective in some of the sickest of the patients um, with, um, very, with vasculitis, uh, can be used in rheumatoid arthritis, and you have it. You just need the expertise. Um, to give it. And I think, Becky, can I, uh, would you like to interject here? He can. Okay. And I don't know if Brahano is there. Um, okay. Yes, so I think. Okay, Becky? Yeah. Yes, I'm here, but. Uh... Yeah, so they were just I was just asking um, more about rheumatology in Ethiopia. Yeah, as uh, correctly mentioned by you. Uh, sorry for my uh, connection. I don't know if I'm audible. Uh, oh, okay. So well, we can hear you, but it's it's okay. But go ahead, Becky, so that we can hear from yeah, you. Yeah. So. Okay, he's, okay, well, I got one question that makes me very sad. Okay, it said, is rheumatology for all program ongoing for other physicians who are interested in rheumatology field? So the answer is, is that it is incredible, has been incredibly um, difficult for us to get all the funding that we would like. So we are sponsoring a very you people, but our hope is that Becky and Barhano will be joined um, maybe by one or two other people in the near future and will eventually be able to train people in rheumatology uh, locally uh, at, at Black Lion. Um, rheumatology, I think that um, everyone needs uh, or we can try to provide more education. So uh, Becky and Brahano can only work X number of hours a day or they're gonna fall apart. So we wanna make sure that we give you the tools to, to treat some of the uh, less complicated people. Uh, on your, um, yourself and um, 
be able to refer patients, um, the, the sickest patients, to uh, Becky and Brahana. Uh, okay, this and the osteoarthritis and some of the joint diseases. Okay, so this is a very good question. Is thank you so much for um, the presentation. Is would uh, like to ask my opinion about treatment of osteoarthritis and some of the other joint diseases with intraarticular steroids. I'm asking this because it seems like it's becoming routine treatment in many places with no or minimal long-term benefits clinically, as well as from patient-reported outcomes and quality of life. That's a great question. So I have to tell you that a million years ago when I was a fellow, I tried to do a research project on the harms of corticosteroid injections. And it's been very difficult because um, it's most commonly used for osteoarthritis and I guess rheumatoid arthritis, is to separate the natural history of the disease um, from the harms of rheumatoid arthritis, uh, of the corticosteroid injection. I have to tell you, I'm in Philadelphia. The first corticosteroid injections in joints were done in Philadelphia by um, Joseph Hollander at the University of Pennsylvania, not my university. So, and I had the privilege of seeing him when he was very elderly, inject a very heavy man's hip with no ultrasound or anything to get right into it. So um, I think that there is a place for intraarticular steroids, um, but I think that we have to be careful because we really don't know the harms. Uh, people with osteoarthritis, um, weight reduction, if they're overweight, um, is something that we do. Uh, the other, uh, I know that there are some joint replacements that are done in Ethiopia. Uh, it's also looking what we can do for prevention. Um, there's ergonomics um, that a lot of this I know is not possible. Um, I mean, even here, I can't stand to see a jackhammer operator because I know, um, you know, I know what it, it, it's going to cause harm. So I am not giving you. A good answer. Uh, my own personal, actually I've become more conservative. I used to not inject the same joint more than three times in a year and um, I'm mainly supervisory right now but I, I would say not even three times a year unless you've got like a you know 85 year old person who's can't take anything orally uh, I might might do that. Um, we also use the injections in people who have rheumatoid arthritis who have lots of inflammation and maybe to get one or two joints uh, under control. Uh, Baruch, does that, is that helpful? Oh, <laughs> your question for Becky. It's a long answer. I won't even... Uh, Oh, dengue. <laughs> okay, so we read about dengue and chikungunya, uh, but we don't see it. I live in a very cold environment. The problem with chikungunya, I'm not going to say too much about dengue, is that they can develop a chronic arthritis. And um, so uh, I think this goes on to the beginning of my talk uh, when I was talking about the epidemiology. So uh, chikungunya would have to be in an endemic area, fever, uh, the joint pain is, can be quite severe, um, but we're learning more about, about these diseases. And I know that they are trying to use, uh, in people who have chronic arthritis with chikungunya, uh, methotrexate has been tried. Okay, so the next one is a 55-year-old man with tophaceous scalp a treatment with allopurinol, 100 milligrams a day, and colchicine previously had a serum uric acid of 2. Oh, a creatinine of 2, I'm sorry, and a uric acid of 7.5. Currently still has big toe and toe phi. Serum creatinine is 1, and uric acid is 5.2. Okay, what uh, we do is we treat to target with uh, people who have tophaceous scout. And um, if you... If someone's got a lot of toe five, we'll treat to, to five. If someone doesn't have a lot of toe five, we treat to six. 
to maintain it, and the TOFI will disappear. It's just going to take a while. There is a drug which I've never used and I will not re recommend, which is Peglodocase. And um, in my mind, um, that will dissolve the drugs, the uh, TOFI, more rapidly, but it can be quite toxic. It's hugely expensive. And what we really need to do is to treat these patients. So um, this gentleman, if you keep his uric acid at 5.2, the TOFI will go away. But it may take a year or so, or depending on how many TOFI he has. What it, okay, you're treating him fine. Okay. You're going to have to, like I said, I, I've never seen a case of dengue or chikungunya. So I think that doctors Becky and Brahana are going to write the book on that one. Let's see. Any, any further questions? How about rheumatoid arthritis? Let me see. Is this, any questions on rheumatoid? Oh, here's two more. Just a second. Oh, do you have a program for pediatricians who want to pursue the So So uh, the answer is... Um, do you have a program for pediatricians? We, we are exploring that right now, but um, we're leaving all of that to the local, to the local people. I, I don't do anything with selecting. Um, yeah, dengue is one of the, the neglected tropical diseases, yes. Now, one of the things, when we were in um, Ethiopia, we did see, we saw a lot of rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, I saw people with seronegative arthritis. I saw people with... Um, polymyositis. Um, I'm concerned that I'm not hearing anything about these. Or have any of you seen uh, and scleroderma? We saw everything. Scleroderma. Uh, any comments or questions of these diseases? Oh, okay. This is a good one. Do we have any statistical data on RA in, in Ethiopia? Not yet. Um, this is the problem. Is um, when you look at the epidemiology of um, various diseases in Africa, uh, you need uh, people on the ground to, to make the diagnosis and to gather uh, the data. And so I don't have the statistics unless Becky or Bahana have something uh, uh, to say, but we will be collecting this. Um, there's all kinds of um, problems that, that are not insurmountable, and I think you're going to get better, is um, access to medications. Um, methotrexate, I guess back it's not there, but um, when I was there, there was problems accessing methotrexate, but I, I'm hoping since we now have two rheumatologists here that we, you can get the methotrexate more easily. Um, it works. It's a, it's a great drug. And um, the, the biologics will be coming. Any? Uh, I don't know if Becky is hearing us, but uh, I think they have a clinic twice a week in Black Lion Hospital. Maybe if you can tell us about those clinic hours and how the other practicing physicians from other hospitals and other clinics can refer their patients so that they can be seen by either Becky or Braham in this specialty clinic. Uh, yes, uh, I think that I am audible now. I hope I'm audible for it. It's better, yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. So I was uh, previously saying uh, the rheumatology practice in Ethiopia, uh, you know, it's, it's at its infancy. So we just started uh, a rheumatology unit. It's been like uh, six months after we completed our uh, uh, subspecialty certificate in South Africa, me and my colleague, uh, thanks to Dr. Michel and the Rheumatology for All uh, organization. 
Uh, now we have a fully uh, developed uh, rheumatology unit, which stands by itself. You know, uh, rheumatology patients used to be under uh, care by other physicians, especially nephrology consultants. But now we have uh, our own uh, rheumatology unit. We have uh, rotating residents. They come every month. So we, uh, we have... Uh, twice weekly presentations. We have also two twice weekly uh, clinics. So our clinics, uh, approximately we see uh, around uh, 140 patients per week. So uh, it's, it ranges like 100 to 140. So majority of 70%, I can say it's inflammatory arthritis, uh, about 50, 60%. Uh, uh, majority of them uh, will be rheumatoid arthritis. We have connective tissue disease like SLE, uh, scleroderma and inflammatory myositis. And uh, we, you know, we have like one or two of uh, vasculitis cases uh, each month. Uh, so now we are uh, practicing both in the government and uh, private setup as well. So we are, uh, actually building up the uh, rheumatology uh, units. Yeah, thank you very much. So, I mean, yeah, so it's important um, for all of you to know that they're there at Black Line, but also to be able to recognize um, these diseases, um, to be able to, to send, to refer them. So here's another question I got, is how do you see the place of high hyaluronic acid intraarticular and osteoarthritis? Um, not much. So the high hyaluronic acid came out, it's been like, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago. And it was a hope that the high hyaluronic acid would uh, improve the cartilage in people who have osteoarthritis. and the studies have just not been um, that good. There's a huge placebo response when you do injections. And um, I, the high hyaluronic acid is quite expensive. And my own personal opinion is um, I think that money could be used in better ways, maybe with physical therapy. Um, but it, 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 it's really fallen pretty much out of favor unless you're trying to make some, excuse me for being cynical, but it's a money maker. But I don't think it's, uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it in most cases. Uh, There's a question that I got <clears throat> uh, from a message. Is it like how we, maybe Becky, or we'll answer. How are we diagnosing SLE in Ethiopia? And is there anything in rheumatology for all working towards? Uh, just asking how, you know, what are the diagnosis status maybe we have towards SLE? You can broaden it and make it maybe uh, for the other uh, rheumatology diseases as well. Uh, yeah, uh, one of the limitations we have. Uh... Uh, as a country, you know, diag diagnostic uh, modalities. Uh, but currently we have, you know, uh, at least we, ha we have the capacity to do uh, uh, like uh, antibody tests like uh, rheumatoid factor, uh, acute reactants like ASR and CRP. Uh, but uh, investigations like anti-nuclear antibody, we can only do the qualitative tests. But we have two private setups where they send uh, the sample to India, and uh, that way we are we are actually practicing uh, doing uh, anatiters quantitative tests. So we can do all the quantitative uh, anti-nuclear antibodies, means uh, double-stranded DNA and complement levels, which are uh, important diagnostic tools for uh, SLE. So we actually start with a clinical uh, uh, approach. So if a patient is high, uh, if a patient has high, high index of suspicion for SLE, like if a patient present with uh, polyarthritis, 
photosensitivity, constitutional symptoms, uh, skin rash, if uh, the patient has cytopenia, uh, renal involvement with proteinuria. Uh, so, you know, majority of patients will not have all of these features. Uh, they might have two or uh, three of these features. So we tend to do this uh, anal qualitative test. The problem with that is majority of our qualitative tests is always it comes up negative. Actually, I haven't seen a positive result. So we actually uh, communicate with the patients and we send the sample outside. So it might cost around, you know, for Anna Titer, around 2,000 to uh, 3,000 birth. So majority of the patients might not afford it, but, you know, if we tell them about the necessity of the test, and that prognostic uh, indication of the test. So the majority of the patients are willing to do it. So once we, uh, we have that, so uh, we can actually uh, uh, diagnose a cell. So we, we can either use a clinical uh, uh, classification criteria, ACR, ACR-QLR-2019 criteria uh, to diagnose uh, a cell as well. Uh, so uh, the same for anti uh, rheumatoid arthritis. We don't have anti-CCP, so we uh, also send anti-CCP outside. Uh, so currently, actually, a majority of, I can say, majority of our patients uh, have these anatitis and anti-CCP. So previously, you know, before we uh, practice rheumatology in Ethiopia, uh, majority of the inflammatory arthritis are labeled as rheumatoid arthritis. So uh, one of the things we see in our clinic is uh, those patients who are labeled as rheumatoid are actually not rheumatoid. Majority of them will be uh, re-diagnosed as SLE, uh, gouty arthritis or osteoarthritis. So especially these diagnostic tests are uh, very important. Uh, I hope I was more informative enough. Thank you, Becky. Um, Michelle, if you want to add something. Uh, I, I think it's fabulous what they're doing, but my experience, my limited experience in the, the clinic there was uh, really exactly as he says. And I think that as an American, we've become lazy um, because we have access to all these, the testing, but that is why um, it's so important what I've discussed because you can make an incredible, incredibly accurate uh, diagnosis um, by just the history and the physical. And so you have some of the limitations become acts, uh, become um, actually make you better docs. Uh, I think that as an American, we're so used to being able to order these blood tests that we're and not even blood tests. We do ultrasounds. We do everything. But I think that as a clinician, you can do an amazing job just using your fingertips and your ears. But you have to be aware. I mean, that, that's a problem, too, is because unless you have had exposure to these diseases, you may not know enough. But that's, uh, that's why, I mean, I, I really, the ACR, I mean, I'm biased because I'm an American, but the, the rheumatology, um, the American College of Rheumatology oh, website oh. is extremely helpful. It is not always user-friendly. They also have, um, it's called an image bank, and... There are thousands of, uh, not thousands, hundreds of pictures. So you can go through there and it can help you as far as being able to recognize uh, what something looks like. Becky, there's a question for you about how you joined this program since um, maybe you can give them a few words um, about the program. Uh, so I, uh... I was interested in uh, immunity, so that's what uh, drive me into the rheumatology practice. You know, when I was a uh, second year resident, uh, there was uh, this group of uh, physicians coming for uh, S S CME, uh, from especially from US, like Dr. Michelle and her colleagues. So after we had this uh, 
uh, continuous uh, medical education program. Uh, so that's how we started. Uh, 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 we plan to join a rheumatology unit. So after we finish our internal medicine uh, residency uh, with uh, the help of the rheumatology uh, for all NGO program, which is uh, uh, headed by Dr. Michel. So we were fortunate enough to join rheumatology practice uh, to attend our subspeciality training in South Africa. So we are, uh, so in the rheumatology uh, clinic, it's only uh, given in Tugramba South Italian Addis Ababa University. It's the sole rheumatology clinic in the whole Ethiopia. So uh, we are actually the first uh, uh, rheumatologist uh, practicing in Ethiopia. We have one uh, previously, uh, he's a Dr. Zanaba, he's uh, a neurologist. Uh, he was also, uh, uh, practicing as rheumatologist, he helped build the rheumatology clinic. Uh, so after we came, uh, we had uh, already practicing the rheumatology clinic, so we had to modify it. Uh... <clears throat> Excellent. Hopefully, in due time, we'll have our own rheumatology program in Ethiopia. We will have more rheumatologists being trained abroad, and if we have enough capacity, hopefully the goal would be to have our own fellowship program. Is that something that's we're thinking down the line? Yes. <laughs> that, that is precisely our goal. And actually, the next question is, right in the same ballpark. It said, is there a rheumatology a RA association in Ethiopia and a support group for patients as coping mechanism as chronic and devastating uh, these are? So this is one thing. Um, I mean, Becky and Brahano are so busy, but um, the, the best for this, so there is nothing yet but what we need is um, a patient. Uh, that's usually the ones who, who do this. Uh, so there's a huge need. These support groups are extremely help, uh, helpful. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you have a, a patient with rheumatoid arthritis uh, or, or lupus, I don't know, Becky, I mean, Poor Becky, I keep um, beating up on Becky and, uh, and Brahana because the other thing is uh, to get materials in um, Amharic. Uh, one of the, the problems that I had when I was in Ethiopia is, of course, the, the language barrier in the clinic. A lot of people didn't speak English, and uh, we really need to, uh, with time, to get reading material in uh, Amharic. Oh, reading materials, Dr. Would you please share us your reading materials, Dr. Becky? So, Becky? I uh, guess uh, I'd be happy to show you. Uh, so we have a standard uh, books, rheumatology books, like uh, Kelly Hochberg. Uh, apart from that, uh, we had also uh, finished uh, Euler course, uh, a two-year two -year, uh, online course. So we have that material as well uh, from the European League Against Rheumatism. Uh, so I'm happy to share with you. And then also, if you have, I don't know if you have yet, because again, I mean, you've got so much on your plate, but uh, anything that's in uh, Amharic or not in English about the drugs and the diseases, this is really a problem, and this is everywhere, is that people need to understand what's wrong with them. And compliance is such a huge, huge problem with our medications. And especially some of our meds like prednisone uh, that people need to, know, need to know about. But I think this is with time. I don't think you can do everything uh, all at one sitting. So I think, I think that's, uh, Becky and Brahana will get there and we'll try to help them as we want. Okay, so then the next question is, is I want to know more about adding methotrexate 
on patients who were already taking uh, prednisolone. Thank you. Okay, so this is um, monitoring methotrexate is extremely important. So I think I'm, I'm going to hate to defer again to Becky because uh, I think you need to make sure you have your diagnosis and also there's guidelines for monitoring methotrexate. Uh, and I, Becky, what, what is your feeling in someone other than yourself yeah. giving uh, methotrexate, uh, yourself and uh, Brahana? Uh, yeah, so uh, to start with, once we make uh, the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, uh, patients should be started on uh, DMARD therapy. So prednisolone alone uh, is not a treatment. So uh, prednisolone is a drug we use to alleviate acute symptoms, the swelling. Uh, so that would not be a chronic management because as uh, it has uh, very grave uh, side effects. So for chronic therapy, we use uh, DMADs. So the DMADs we use are either chloroquine, uh, uh, methotrexate, or sulfasalazine. Uh, so we usually uh, choose uh, either of these DMADs depending on the clinical condition of the patient. So we use uh, ACR guideline. If patients have uh, lower disease activity, uh, if patients do not have the poor prognostic factors, uh, one might start chloroquine uh, uh, as a first line. But if you have higher disease activity with uh, more uh, uh, poor prognostic factors, uh, methotrexate uh, should be started. So methotrexate is a backbone of rheumatoid arthritis uh, treatment. So that's what we are practicing now. We usually, uh, based on this uh, a scenario we start patients with methotrexate. Uh, so we uh, usually pre investigate before we start methotrexate. Uh, we do uh, for every patient, we do complete blood count, uh, hepatitis B and C screening, HIV. We do chest x ray, liver function tests, and renal function tests. Uh, so uh, once everything is uh, okay, we can start with a lower dose of methotrexate, like 7.5. So it's recommended to follow these patients at least for the first uh, one month. Uh, it's recommended to follow every two weeks. But what we do is uh, we uh, repeat this uh, specialist CBC liver function and renal function after one month. Then after one month, we see how to scale it therapy with the metric set as well. After that, we usually follow them every three months by doing CBC and uh, liver function test or with renal function test. Uh, so that's how we are uh, actually following uh, patients who are on methotrexate. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so one of the problems that I saw, um, again, when I was in last time in Ethiopia, was the overuse of the uh, corticosteroids. And I think that part of the problem is that there was no one there to manage the methotrexate, but the, there's very few drugs that we can look people in the eye and say, yes, you will have toxicity of this drug, um, and that's prednisone or prednisolone. So um, we use it when necessary, but we really try to avoid it, and this is the benefit of having uh, uh, Becky and Bahano uh, at the rheumatology clinic is the expertise, because you want to really make sure that they have the disease, and there's uh, a lot of patient education uh, in using the methotrexate as well. To answer an earlier question about reading materials for patients and families in Amharic, uh, we've been uh, in, in our website on yet in our web, website we have made one or two podcasts about rheumatoid arthritis and some other common rheumatological diseases in Amharic. But we also want to make more articles written in Amharic. Maybe we can use Becky and Anne to review the articles before they are published. But we work closely with Ethiopia Medical Student Association and the students have been translating some materials and we verify with them and we'll make them available. But 
now that we have you know this organization and also Becky and Mohammed and you can um, you know ask them to review before it's, pub, uh, it's posted on the website but we'll try to make sure at least we have you know at least on some the most common 10 or 15 diseases we can have some things written in Amharic and some of them are already being posted. Well that's wonderful because it's really scary. Uh, one of the things that's hard with our diseases um, is you don't look bad, but you you know there's no you know you've got the husband that you got to tell him that you know you've got lupus you look good but you can't take care of the kids and uh, even with the rheumatoid arthritis the morning stiffness can be really a problem so the patient needs to understand it but the family the employer the children everyone else needs to understand it uh, as well and as I mentioned before I think compliance can be a problem with people who don't understand what's going on. So that, that's fantastic. I don't see any more questions. We can, you think we can wrap our discussion and CME today or? You can have some few words, Becky, Dr. Michelle. All I can say, this has been an incredible, um, I mean, everyone's younger than me, but sometimes you, um, you kind of go, well, I think I should do something, and then you do it, and then we have Becky and Brahano, and uh, rheumatology is going to grow in, uh, in Ethiopia. You, you got to start slow and but think big and um uh, it's been wonderful and uh, I, I think that we need to learn a lot more uh, i mean you asked me about dengue and chukyonga i mean i don't know what other diseases are lurking there or um the epidemiology we need to just find out more um uh, and uh yeah, it's been wonderful, and thank you for this opportunity. And I want to thank you, uh, Fitzum. This is uh, a wonderful organization uh, that you have, and this is really—it's um, only. I mean, the rheumatology for all. I basically what our mission statement is is that it's only by increasing education uh, that we're going to help people. And so this venue was was very nice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's been an honor for us to have you here and to see what the work you're doing is uh, in Matumbu Service in Ethiopia. And again, thank you everyone who attended this um, webinar. I hope to see Ethiopia Medical Students Association representative and Ethiopia Medical Association uh, representatives today. I think because there was a problem with the panelist link, but they have been very wonderful working together with us to make sure physicians and residents are able to attend this webinar. And just a reminder for Becky again, if uh, you want any help in creating patient resource materials in local language, we have volunteer medical students and physicians working in our group. So if you send us papers or anything that must be translated or you want something, we can work closely with you again. And oh, I'm going to interrupt you for one second. What about the self-help? Do you think you have, um, you work only, uh, if anyone's interested in starting a self-help, a support group? Um, I, I think we can guide them and uh, help them connect with the right people, especially maybe in the ministry and other health sector people. Uh, but anything they want to do, especially, you know, self-help self groups, they need a website, they need resources on how to manage these things. So we can definitely help them. Uh, go forward. So uh, I think it was Senai who asked that question. So like if you want to start a uh, rheumatology support group or rheumatoid arthritis support group, we can give you some ideas on how to go forward in creating some, this kind of volunteer association. We'll be very happy to do it. Yeah. And also in the, um, so there are American, like the um, Arthritis Foundation that I'm sure if someone's doing this, I could Put them up in touch with an American association that may, I'm not saying they will, but that may be able to, to help them. There's also, um, there's an organization called Creaky, C-R-E-A-K-Y Joints, and it's actually run by two men. One of them had um, 
ankylosing spondylitis. And I contacted him them a few years ago uh, about getting their material translated into Amharic, but uh, I never did. But uh, they take, I'm a little snooty, I don't like to take money from uh, pharmaceutical companies, but they do, but I don't think they advertise too much. But that's another area that you may look to. It's, uh, it's creaky joints and then the Arthritis Foundation, the Lupus Foundation, we have everything. Uh, for, uh, and they all have uh, patient materials, uh, but you want something homegrown, but we can help you uh, at this. And, and most of the people who do this nonprofit work uh, are usually more than happy to help you out. So just, you know, just shoot them an email or whatever, uh, and they'll, they'll help you. Yeah, I shared the link for Creaky Joints on the chat panel. Uh, so, and you, you got a lot of resources there. And uh, Brahanu and Becky, if you want to share like some of your reading materials for other physicians, you can use this physician's uh, network group that we have on Telegram. Uh, I, I know that they can probably have joined this uh, platform. So for those who have been asking where they can get some reading materials, maybe you can join that group. And if you ask there, it will be easy for us to share reading resources. Uh, so I shared you the link for our group and the Creaky Joints link also have shared you. So if you want to check that. Um, I think, yeah, uh, we have come to the end of our discussion. Thank you all our panelists again. It was a wonderful Saturday. Thank you, Michelle, for taking your time. Uh, hopefully we'll do more of this additional lecture so we might again in the future too. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Thank Saturday. You for your Bye. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.